Hello and um, thanks for clicking on the video. This uh, is going to be a review of the Seiko uh, Turtle, the SRP777. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. I'm a, a Seiko collector. Uh, I collect Seiko divers, primarily older models from the 60s and 70s and uh, when I can find them, vintage Grand Seiko. And I work for a watch retailer in Brisbane, Australia and uh, we're a stockist of Seiko. And we also stock Grand Seiko in our Sydney store as well. Um, now, in October this year, I was lucky enough to be invited to tour the GS factories in Japan. Um, and one evening when we were on the trip, um, we were sitting around talking about an old vintage Seikos with some of the guys that were with us. And one of the fellows from Seiko Australia mentioned that he'd seen a diver that was part of the upcoming releases for 2016 in the Prospect series. And that it sounded a lot like some of the, the divers that we were talking about. So of course straight away we were interested to see what it was going to be and uh, the following day he showed us an image in an email of the upcoming releases for 2016 and to be honest I just about fell over when I saw it was going to be a, a faithful reissue of the 63097040 which is probably one of my favourite divers I think that Seiko have made. Um, now I mean Seiko it's not a company that is you know, usually known for uh, looking into their back catalogue for inspiration. Um, and when they do, they don't you know, normally so precisely recreate a past model. Uh, I mean, obviously the recent Grand Seiko Heritage models would be a bit of an exception there. So, so the minute we saw this watch, we were enthusiastic about it, and we placed a, a pre-order to get as many of them as we could, because you know, we thought it was going to be popular. Now, we were expecting these to arrive in about, um, about this time in January, actually, but we were lucky enough that uh, we got a shipment in just before uh, December. Uh, well, uh, just before Christmas time, in the, about the middle of December. Now, my job, I get to handle a lot of high-end watches uh, from, you know, the big brands, uh, but also a lot of mid-tier Swiss offerings as well. And look, to be honest, I can say that this watch definitely competes uh, in terms of quality and certainly from a value for money point of view. So the following review is about the SRP777, and we'll take a quick look at the other, uh, the blue dial and the gilt dial versions towards the end of the video. But I think really where we need to start is uh, with the watch that started it all, the watch that it, uh, the new version is based on which is this example here, let so the focus catch up. So this is a 6309-7040. Um, now this particular watch I bought locally here, it was a bit of a basket case and I've uh, done some restoration work on it. I was lucky enough to find a new old stock bezel to go on it. Uh, and it does have a domed crystal, uh, obviously the original being flat, but it's a very good example of the watch that, you know, it's very familiar to well, pretty much anybody that that collects Seiko and I think it's one of those sort of designs that's almost as iconic to Seiko as the tuner, uh, which is of course the other famous model that they make. So it's this wonderful combination of this sort of soft uh, rounded case, uh, the brushed and polished finishes, the clear and legible dial uh, and you know the robust uh, construction and uh, the robust and accurate movement that's inside the case that makes it a real favorite amongst collectors I think. Uh, also, I mean, the watch had a fairly long production run from the mid 70s to about the mid to late 80s, which means there's quite a few of these guys around, which makes them a little bit more accessible, I think, in terms of price point um, for a lot of people. The downside, of course, being is that you know, now that these watches have been out of production for you know a good long time, spare parts are starting to be increasingly hard uh, to find for them. Um, you know, that always makes me a little bit hesitant to to use them for. Well, a collectible watch for you know, the reasons that it was originally created. So, um, you know, you certainly would think very carefully before you went swimming in a watch like this. Uh, this particular example has passed a pressure test. But, I mean, should there ever be a leak, the dial and hands in this, which are in really nice condition, would be very hard to replace. So, um, it, it generally makes me more cautious when I'm using my older sports watches. And I think that's one of the great things about Seiko reissuing or uh, reintroducing this case shape. And that's with the SRP777, I get a watch that's you know, very much based off of this watch, but it's modern, 
it's you know waterproof to 200 meters i can use it in the way that is you know it's properly intended and i don't have to baby it and you know very worst case scenario if it gets flooded it's a current production model i can get you know another or i can get replacement parts for it so so that's the the 6309 um we'll come back and compare it a little bit more closely with the srp triple seven later on but uh, i think what we need to do from here is to actually move on to the new model i'll put this one back on the stand so here it is this is the srp triple uh, seven um, it's probably i would have to say one of the most accurate reissues i've seen from well, really from any brand. Um, a lot of manufacturers have gone down the retro route in recent years, um, you know, doing heritage uh, recreations of their, their older models. Um, now, more often than not, those recreations have referenced several models from a brand's history and sort of mixed them together while changing some fundamental aspect of the design to suit modern tastes. Now, a good example of that would be the Tudor Black Bay, uh, which takes its basic design from the earliest Tudors. Uh, the Tudor St. Mariners, um, but it also combines it with a handset from the later Tudor Snowflake from the 70s. Um, and in, in the case of that particular watch, the case is both wider and it's taller than the original models that it's based on. Um, you know, with the result of that, although it's a very attractive and popular model, it doesn't necessarily give a true representation of a brand's history. So, um, now I think really it's a bit of an indication of how right Seiko got this design back in the 1970s that you can reissue it. Uh, so faithfully 40 years later in almost unaltered form and it looks as purposeful and attractive as it did uh, when it first entered the market. Now, you know, make no mistake, the SRP777 is, you know, apart from some minor changes, almost a direct reproduction of the original and those few changes that have been made really benefit uh, the robustness of the new watch. Now the width of the case uh, from one side to the other here, it's 45mm uh, just like the originals. Um, uh, the lug width across the top here for the straps is 22, just like the original, which is a great size. And a lot of manufacturers these days, they go for a, an odd size, like a 21 or a 23. It makes it very hard to get aftermarket straps for, but there's a good range of straps that you can fit onto this watch. And uh, the other thing you'll notice too, if you look at the watch, is it retains the, the very sort of subtle concave effect of the bezel insert here. You can see it turn across that way. It's only very slight, but the bezel itself sort of slopes down towards the flat hardlex crystal, which is the same uh, type of crystal that was used on the original watches as well. The case uh, is actually slightly taller than the original. Let's see if we can get a side-by-side -side sort of comparison of that. So if we line them up like that, you can see it's just slightly taller than the original. Um, and I think that's, it's not so much about the case body itself, it's more about the height of the bezel uh, on the new watch. And of course that also has to accommodate a different movement from you know, what's inside the 6309 there as well. Now the other thing of course with that uh, case shape too, you can see it sort of it slopes down a little bit more towards the uh, uh, where the bracelet or the rubber strap attaches to the side of the watch. Um, the other big improvement I think over the original is these guys here, the drill through lugs. That's going to make it a lot simpler to change the straps on these and it, it is the Seiko heavy duty spring bars that are in there too. And, to be honest, they're a little bit notorious and hard to get out of a watch, so um, that, uh, that's definitely going to make it easier to change straps. Not that you're probably going to feel like you need to, because the new strap that's on these uh, watches, it's a softer sort of silicon strap. It's got these great metal keepers on them now, uh, rather than the older rubber style ones, and a Seiko signed uh, uh, tang buckle there as well. So it's a really comfortable soft uh, strap with slightly sort of uh, lower wave vents on it than the Z22s that were on the XKX007. You know, they're, uh, I have to admit, a bit of an acquired taste for me, that the older XKX007 straps, they were a little bit plasticky, but I know a lot of people found them, uh, you know, a comfortable strap to wear. So we'll take the watch off the C-clip and we're just going to have a look at the case back. So you can see looking at the case back, it's, um, it's fairly minimalist in terms of the amount of information back there. Probably slightly less text on there than there was on the um, the uh, 6309, really, when you look at it. Uh, in the center, of course, pretty much unchanged from when it was first introduced uh, in the 1970s, the uh, Tsunami Wave, for, for want of a better name. Very similar to the 6309, nice and raised in the center of the case back there, a nice sharp sort of uh, relief engraving. Obviously the difference here is that the, the background in the 6309 Tsunami Wave is a little bit more matte with a polished wave. This is an all polished finish. The rest of the text pretty much identifies this as a part of Seiko's air diver range, so it's not a saturation diver of course. 
and it's a member of the Prospex family. So the uh, the rather controversial PX symbol down the bottom there, or the, the Prospex X if you prefer. Um, now all of the examples that I have in my collection and that we got uh, in the store are from November. So November last year. So I would imagine they're probably pretty close to the first of these models. A uh, fairly you know, early production run. So uh, the other thing we can see when we look at the back here is probably the other major difference in the case. Uh, if we look around at the crown area there, focus catches up, there we go. You can see it's more a traditional crown compared to the 6309. So it's the little dimple is there, like the 6309, but where the, the crown on the 6309 is set into a recess here, so there's a little extra piece. This is a flatter style crown, a little bit more like the XKX007 crown in that respect. So. Um, it screws down nicely, the crown on this particular watch. It's, uh, it's got about three turns uh, for a full screw down, so it's very like a 6309 crown in that, that respect. Nice and smooth in its action too. So uh, I'd imagine with that change in the back there around the crown, it's probably to do with making the crown uh, on the watch easier to manufacture as well for Seiko, so a little less machining in the final case. So now I think the, the next thing we need to look at is the dial and hands on this particular watch. You can see very faithful to the original design, just as, a, you know, as with the case on this watch. Um, it neatly reproduces the 6309 uh, dial with some subtle modern touches. The dial reintroduces the, uh, the sword shaped marker at 12 o'clock there, which we haven't had on a diver from Seiko in this sort of price range uh, for a little bit. Um, we've also got the wedge shaped markers around here at the 9 and 6 o'clock point. In this particular example, which is an Australian market version, uh, the day wheel and these particular watches and, and all Australian delivered watches are English and a Chinese slash Japanese kanji. Um, now I believe the symbols in kanji for the number of the day of the week are the same in both languages. So it's not the, the name of the day like it is in the Japanese domestic market watches. So it's a, um, a nice touch and makes it a little bit like a 6309, uh, 6306 in that case, uh, which obviously the Japanese domestic market version of the original 6309. So uh, if we look at the markers themselves, we can see they're an applied marker. Um, they're uh, slightly domed and they've got a sort of raised edge around the outside of them, which gives the dial a very sort of um, a subtle 3D appearance. And you can see it quite, quite clearly there if we turn the watch a little bit on its side. You can see that sort of raised, uh, raised aspect of the markers. So, I mean, those sort of markers remind me a little bit of some 6309s that I've seen that have uh, loom plots that sit up a little bit higher uh, than some others, and it's that sort of look that this dial has, I guess, most closely. Uh, now, the other thing I guess we have to, to mention here, I mean, on this particular example, you can see the minute marker looks you know, pretty well aligned. Now, there's been a lot of talk online at various forums about the alignment issues on these. Um, and look, I have to admit, I mean, I've, I've examined all of the watches that we received as part of our shipment, and it, it seems to me that the mod models that, um, that have the most problems with the alignment are the gilt dials. And I was thinking about this the other day. I have a theory um, which might account for that. And I mean, these watches are, well, they're assembled in China. Um, I would imagine they are mostly assembled by machine, um, more than, you know, all that much in the way of human interference with them as they're being made. Now, from looking around the Grand Seiko factories, there is a lot of times where they're using computers in the production process to check the alignments of things. My theory is that perhaps those, um, the computers, the cameras, and the software that they use for checking alignment doesn't read the gilt uh, printing as well, which might account for the way that the, both the black and the blue seem to be you know, more, um, what shall we say, less prone to having alignment issues than the gilt dials do. But I mean, obviously, just a you know, purely a theory. I mean, look, for something like that, Seiko quite often have you know, a few little issues with early production models like these. I mean, the thing that springs to mind is the, the Sumos with the, uh, the day wheels that didn't quite align. Uh, you know, I'm sure after a month or two in production, they'll get those sort of little early hiccups ironed out. Uh, the three watches I have in my collection all have good alignments in them, so it's, you know, it's not too bad. So anyway, going back to the dial, um, talking about the loom uh, on these dials, obviously with all Seikos, it glows like a torch. You can literally read a book by this thing if you give it a charge um, well, on the bedside light before you, you know, turn out the light for the night. Um, you know, really good, and uh, it continues to glow for you know up to six hours, uh, and it's still legible in that time. So probably the, the biggest difference, of course, with this style compared to the original, this is the amount of text that's on there. Uh, the Seiko logo at the top there is, is a bit bigger than on the originals now. And the automatic text has moved from uh, underneath the Seiko logo down to 
uh, underneath here and I'll just move the hand out of the way so you can see the text a little more clearly. So as you can see there, there's the automatic text now sitting down just above the six o'clock marker. So um, the other thing we come to underneath the hands there is again the, the prospects symbol. Um, you know, there's a little bit of controversy about that. Some people are not so keen. In my mind, if that's the price that we pay for a 6309 reissue, then I'm happy to pay that price. I don't mind the logo. I think it's it's great. I mean, you know, you couldn't really put the sewer logo back on there again because the factory's not called that anymore. And anyway, it's not made there. So I'm quite happy with that. Um, and then, of course, finally underneath there, we've got the Divers 200 meter text, uh, which is in place of the original uh, water 150 meter resist text on the original 6309 so that's obviously reflecting the greater water resistance uh, of this watch compared to the originals. So pretty much the only other difference then is I don't know if you can see it very clearly but right down the bottom of the dial there we've got the caliber number um, and the model number that's printed on the bottom of the dial there so um, moving on to look at the hands they look to be pretty much a carryover from the XKX007 um, the handset in, in this particular watch, of course, was originally introduced on the 6309. Um, now, I know a lot of people would say, well, you know, it's the, the 600 meter tuner high beat, but actually, if you look at the hands on those, although they're kind of a similar style, they are a little bit different. So, the, the 6309 was really the first Seiko diver to introduce those sort of iconic hands to, uh, to the Seiko range, and I'm really glad that they've kept those hands uh, in terms of, you know, looking like the originals. Um, again, filled with super lumen over there, like the dial, glow really well. There's a good quantity of lumen there, and it's easy to tell the difference between the hour and minute hand, just as it always has been on these Seiko divers. One of the good things about them, particularly if you use them, you know, for the, the intended purpose of actually going underwater with them. Um, I think you know the the biggest difference there is going to be the sweep hand, and then a lot of people have been talking about replacing that to have the the so-called meatball there on the other end, like the original 6309s. Look, for my money, I think it's kind of cool that they've kept the 007 sweep pan there. I mean, we don't want to forget the 007. It was a great watch. It was in production for 20-odd years. Um, you know, it was the Seiko diver for a lot of uh, people that were first getting into automatic watches, and it's widely respected for, for being a great quality watch at a, you know, an awesome price point. So I think it's nice that they've kept that original that uh, original sweep pan in there as well, which, of course, you know, it wasn't uh, first put into the, the 007. It goes back to the 7548 quartz divers. Um, at the, the end of the 70s there as well. So uh, the next thing to talk about here I guess is the movement. Uh, now we uh, have a welcome upgrade in the movement in these compared to the 007. Uh, so the movement is now the 4R36 uh, which was introduced a few years ago now and the movement has gradually spread through Seiko's uh, affordable automatic watches um, and it's replaced both the 7S26 and the 7S36. Now, although obviously the calibers are related, the 4R36 features both hand winding and hacking features now. Uh, there's a 41 hour power reserve uh, in this particular movement. And it's, you know, it's a thoroughly modern movement uh, and it can definitely hold its own with you know, movements like the, the ETA 2824 and the SW200 um, that you find in a lot of Swiss watches at much higher price points actually. Um, now, my personal experience with this movement is that it's been pretty accurate in the watches that I've had. Um, this particular watch that I've been wearing pretty much since Christmas time it definitely holds up uh, that assessment. This guy runs at, um, well, approximately minus two seconds uh, a day or thereabouts, which is, you know, it's not too bad. And it'd be interesting to see over a bit longer term period uh, whether that timekeeping sort of settles down a little bit and, uh, you know, the accuracy improves. But look, I don't have any doubt with this movement that if I wanted to get it more accurate than that, it should adjust uh, quite easily. And uh, that's certainly something that we can do. Uh, you know, at some point. So that's uh, a look at the, the black dial version of the new Seiko Turtle. Now, uh, the next thing I thought we might move on to would be uh, the two variations. Um, now, in Australia, we're only getting the black, like this one, the blue, and the gilt dial. We're not getting the Pepsi locally, which, to be honest, is a bit of a pain because it means I'm going to have to try and track one down overseas to, to complete my collection. So the first one we're going to have a look at outside of this range is the blue dial. That's this guy here. Now, uh, obviously, this one comes on a bracelet. Let's wait for the focusing to catch up. So this one comes on a bracelet uh, normally. I've got this um, well, rather nice isofran, shall we say, homage strap fitted to it, which I think really matches nicely in uh, with the dial there. Um, 
like, you know, I appreciate Seiko giving us a bracelet option, and I know there's a lot of people that fit a bracelet to their 6309s. I'm a bit more of a traditionalist. I kind of like a strap on a Seiko Diver. It's what the 6309 came on originally, so I think, you know, there's no harm in having, uh, having a watch like this on its rubber strap. Um, now, the blue on this dial, it's, it's quite subtle. Uh, as you can see here, I mean, in this sort of lighting, it looks kind of grey. Um, if you take it out into the, to daylight, it becomes quite a vibrant blue. And it's probably a little bit more subdued than the blue on the, the Blue Mo or the, you know, the Blue Dial Sumo that you can get in the Japanese domestic market one. Other than that, really no difference between this one and the, the SRP777. Um, exactly the same watch case, the whole lot. So, um, you know, it's a great option. It's nice to have something other than just the straight black. I have to admit, I've worn mainly the black since I've got them, but um, I think maybe now that this one's on a rubber strap as opposed to the bracelet, I'll probably wear it a bit more. So then the, uh, the last watch we're going to have a look at is this guy here. Wait for our focus to kick in. So this is the third variation. Uh, it's the Gold Dial SRP775. Um, now you really, you know, you can't help but be reminded looking at this watch of, um, of last year's SBDX012, uh, the limited edition Marine Master. Uh, the Marine Master 300, a great looking watch. Uh, I mean, obviously this is at quite a different price point, but I think you know they do quite a nice job um, of carrying off that sort of gilt dial look. Gives the watch a bit more of a sort of, I want of a better word, a sort of ye olde appearance, I guess. Um, dial and handset really quite lovely on this watch, and you know they give quite a different appearance to the black dial, uh, straight black dial version. And I think you know this watch is different enough from the SRP Triple Seven that you you know you could have this and the black dial in your collection and swap between them and still feel like you were, you know, you had enough in your collection for a bit of variety. Um, the other thing you can see on this particular watch, of course, is the bracelet that, um, that this, the uh, turtle comes on. A nice standard looking sort of oyster bracelet, polished in, uh, in a few sections and brushed mostly. Standard Seiko uh, folding clasp on it uh, with a flip lock with the Seiko name on it. I'd say it's sort of roughly equivalent in quality to a Sumo bracelet, maybe a little bit tinier. It shares the same diver's extension as the standard Sumo bracelet with that little fold-out piece uh, underneath there. Um, it's a good length bracelet too, straight out of the box. I had to take three links out of this to get it to fit, and I have an 80-inch wrist, so it's uh, an easy bracelet to size. It's just standard pin and collar uh, system, a little bit fiddly to put back together until you've done it a few times, but uh, you know, nice and easy to do. I have seen some people mentioning online that this bracelet will actually fit the um, the uh, 6309. The only thing you need to be careful of there, obviously, is uh, the fact that it's solid underneath there. Not going to be very easy to get your bracelet back off a 6309 because, of course, no drill through lugs. Um, and vice versa, actually, bracelets apparently that fit the 6309 will also fit on this, which might open up some options for meshes and, and things like that. So. So, I mean, all up a great looking watch there. Uh, I love the bezel with the, the gold printing and everything in it. Let's face it, I'm probably going to get this onto a, a black version of that Isofran strap that you've seen before and wear it a bit more. So, so I think, you know, in conclusion, um, from the moment I really first saw uh, these watches, I've been hanging out to get my hands on them. Uh, and, they, you know, they certainly haven't disappointed. For me, they pretty much represent the perfect blend uh, of a watch with classic styling, but using, you know, state-of-the-art materials and, you know, really in a supremely usable package. As I mentioned earlier in the review, uh, I now have a watch that, you know, is almost a perfect reproduction of the watch that I love most, the 6309, but I can take it swimming. Um, it's very humid here in Queensland in summertime, and I don't need to worry about wearing the watch around and getting sweaty. Um, the SRP777 that I have here, that's been my companion just recently doing some work around the house, and it's had, uh, you know, plaster dust, it's had sweat, paint, sunscreen, um, you name it on it, and it looks just as good as it did when I first started using it. Just give it a bit of a rinse under the uh, under the tap when you finish with it for the day, and it just scrubs up beautifully. Um, I would highly recommend anybody who's sitting on the fence with this to actually try and get out to a retailer that has them. I, mean, I know they're starting to roll out a bit more widely now, so that you should have the option to go and have a look at it. If you're worried about the, the bezel alignment issue, just talk to your retailer about that. They should have a stock of them, and you can pick you know the best ones out of what they have there. Even if you have some 6309s in your collection, I would highly recommend that you pick these up. A really great quality watch and uh, at a great price point from Seiko. 
So that's pretty much my review. Uh, thanks very much for watching, and um, I hope you enjoyed.